friends or acquaintances. We are family. We are part of the one household. Whether we are related by blood or not, we live in a household together. We are brothers and sisters. How we live as God's family actually shows the world what God is like. Now, the the spiritual work or the service of Christians in God's household is called ministry. We're pretty familiar with that if we've either grown up in the church or been a part of the church for a while. But it's not just the things that I do as a minister that are considered ministry. This is any Christian, any brother or sister in God's house. For example, if you go down the street even with your friend to a coffee shop, you have a coffee, you might share how each other's going, you might even pray for each other. That's ministry. You are ministering to each other at that point. Our passage today, uh, here in 1 Timothy chap- chapter 1, 3 to 17, it's all about household ministry. It's how we relate to each other and serve one another. Ministry in God's household, the church of the living God. So if what we do, if what we do as Christians reflects who Jesus is to the world, how do we do it well? How do we minister to each other in a way that shows Jesus to the world? Well, Paul tells us in chapter 3 why he wrote this letter to Timothy. We looked at this last week. Uh, This is, in a sense, our keynote verse for the term. Uh, But he's written so that people will know how to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Paul's written about how we conduct ourselves in ministry because the church, well, he's written to Timothy about this because the church in Ephesus is actually doing a terrible job. Uh, They're in a mess. Paul's letter shows Timothy how to try and address that, how to fix that. So let's look at why Paul's even writing this letter to Timothy. What are the big problems here in Ephesus that he's addressing and what Timothy's meant to do about it? So we're going to look at the problem of false teachers in the church, the problem of misapplying God's law, but then what a healthy ministry in God's household will look like and what, what are the qualities, if you like, uh, of, of those in the household. So we'll start with the problem of false teaching. Uh, from verse 3 there, the church is in a mess because of false teachers and what they're saying, what they're teaching the people. If you look at this uh, uh, yeah, Bible reading, you see it exploded uh, all the comments that he makes uh, to do with the false teachers. There's false doctrines, there's myths, endless genealogy. So that's family trees, uh, controversial speculations that don't really go anywhere, Meaningless talk. Timothy's job is to command these so-called wannabe teachers of the law. He's got to command them to stop saying false things, things that aren't true. Out of love for God's church, Timothy's got to pull these guys into line. And who are they? Well, they're people who are devoting themselves to myths, endless genealogies, we're told. Now, these guys love to prove that they were true Israelites uh, by by pulling down the family tree and mapping out who they were related to back up the line. 
mapping out their family history to try and prove that they were a part of the church. They were a part of God's family. But the result of all this is controversy. Somehow trying to prove that you might belong more than someone else because, you know, my great-grandfather did this or whatever. There's a lot of speculation and unnecessary infighting when you do this kind of thing. It takes energy and time out of God's, God's household. Stealing time away from the real mission of advancing God's work, advancing God's kingdom. It's got to stop because it's also a salvation issue. People are, are even departing from a sincere faith. It says there in verse 5, people are wandering away from a sincere faith and they've turned to meaningless talk. It's a distraction from the truth about our sin and our need for forgiveness. The church, if it goes down this track, just starts to spin its wheels and going nowhere. But these guys, these false teachers, they teach with great confidence, if you like. They might be good speakers. They might be convincing. But their talk ends up being useless. Paul, who is a Jew and a true expert in the law, uh, particularly in his time, he was well-renowned for knowing the law back to front. He says that they actually have no idea what they're talking about. The church in Ephesus is in a bit of a mess because of all the false teaching that's going on. The lesson here, or part of the lesson, is that an excellent speech doesn't actually ensure that you're hearing the truth. Keep an eye out for impressive speakers because teachers who speak well can actually be passionately wrong. You ever seen that before? Someone who's really passionate about something, but they're just terribly wrong. In God's household, we can't be entertaining false teaching of any kind. We've got to be just a bit watchful of those who might fill our inboxes or our airwaves with distractions that take us away from our central gospel mission, proclaiming Jesus through the healthy ministry of God's church. We're to be aware of those keyboard warriors, if you like, who thrive on controversy and drama. Or perhaps for troublemakers in the church, just every now and then just poking and causing trouble around the edges. They don't necessarily care what you think about them, but that you are thinking about them in some way. Now, some people who are young in the faith, they might accidentally, you know, once or twice, uh, stir up trouble, uh, not meaning to, until they learn how to raise concerns in healthy ways. But the meaningless talkers that Paul's looking at here, they want continual attention. The self-important and self-righteous who can somehow never be pleased in the church. More concerned about their views than advancing the gospel of Jesus. False teachers can appear very smart, very spiritual. But when healthy church members, that's what we're aiming to be, when we step back for a minute and listen to what they're actually saying, you may realise that they've got no idea what they're talking about. And that's the next problem that Paul addresses now, misusing the law. Uh, he, he talks about this in verses 8 to 11. False teachers are misusing the law. It's what they seem to do best. They use the Old Testament scriptures to almost bludgeon people into doing what they want, bludgeoning them into submission. Now, Paul says that the law is good. There in verse 8, God's commandments in the Bible are powerful. 
And if you follow them perfectly, you will be saved. The problem is, no one can follow them perfectly. (laughs) We've all disobeyed God's law, we've broken it, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. The law condemns us because it's not that we can't obey it, it's that we don't. Sometimes we pretend that we keep the law, uh, but we all sin. For example, uh, you shall not murder. Now, I don't think anyone's broken this recently. Might have come close, one or two occasions, but Jesus comes along in Matthew chapter 5 and says that even being angry with your brother or sister is like committing murder in your heart. If you've got a bit of unjustified or unresolved anger there against a brother or sister, it's like committing murder in your heart. And that's one I'm guilty of, and perhaps you are too. Or how about you shall not commit adultery? Jesus says anyone who even looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery in their heart. I'm sure looking lustfully at a bloke has the same consequences. But false teachers, they seem to be talking about the law like they're all over it, like they've mastered it. They're proud of how they think they're following it, but they've got it all wrong, says Paul. His point here is that The law just exposes our sin for what it is. A right application of the law is that it actually shows us our hearts. It reveals our hearts to us. Shows us how sinful they are, our hearts, and reminds us that we need rescuing. Now Paul says the law is not for the righteous. It's a warning, if you like, for the unrighteous. That tells us what we ought not to do if we have the hope of Jesus as our saviour. Paul goes through all kinds of behaviour now that the law condemns. Those things that don't belong in God's household. They actually track pretty closely with the Ten Commandments, the things that he raises. But he kind of caps it off in verse 10 by saying it's all these things and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. Now the Greek word uh, for sound doctrine here is all about health. Uh, This is the word that we uh, get the word hygiene from. Uh, He's talking about health-giving doctrine or ways of thinking. In verse 11, Paul tells us what healthy doctrine is. It's teaching produced by the gospel. It's applying the good news of Jesus, his life, death, resurrection and ascending back into heaven to our lives. It's what happens when we start living for Jesus, if you like. Living like Jesus as members of the household of the living God. Now, legalistic church leaders just want everyone following the rules. You know, you get in trouble if you don't follow the rules. But in God's household, it's your relationship with God and your brothers and sisters in the house. That's what really matters. It's about God's love being lived out in your life, your relationships. See, when you start to follow Jesus, your life changes. You start wanting what God wants. Yes, your life actually does start to line up with the law because the law is only the shadow of the reality that was to come. 
the reality of Jesus. And so when you start to live like Jesus, you start to find that you, you're keeping the law, perhaps even without thinking about it. So the church, the household of God, including everyone here in the room today, is full of people who can testify how our lives began to change when we started following Jesus as our Lord. As we began to put our old sinful ways behind us, we stopped all of those things that were going against God's law. We might have stopped avoiding taxes. We might have stopped speeding so much on the highways. Perhaps we started to fight off addictions that we knew were wrong. Addictions to alcohol or gambling or pornography. We stopped ignoring God and began to pray to him instead. We stopped hating people in our heart spiritually murdering them and started trying to love them as a fellow human made in the image of God. Paul's point here is that our motivation for these things isn't from a fear of the law. We sang about that earlier. We don't fear anymore but we, we love Jesus for rescuing us. This is the glorious, blessed way to live. So Paul has given Timothy now the lowdown on these serious problems facing the church there in Ephesus. The way that false teachers have been teaching, their misuse of the law... These are problems that hinder healthy ministry, healthy interactions between God's people. But what do we look for if we want healthy ministry? How do we ensure, how do we ensure God's household has healthy ministry workers, healthy ministry going on, and that we're all following healthy doctrine, healthy ways of thinking. Well, the qualifications aren't a string of letters after your name, all the different things you might have studied at university or college. Study can be helpful, but the qualifications here don't come from a degree. Paul says... True teaching is about advancing God's work, which is by faith. He says the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. A pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Now, what you don't see is at the end of year 12... Uh, the graduate from high school packing their bags and going off to university to get a degree in how to have a pure heart. You don't see that, do you? A pure heart, a good conscience and a sincere faith. You see, people who lead the church in these areas stand in stark contrast to false teachers. They become the models for everybody. False teaching leads to chaos and controversy. But the goal of true teaching is love. False teaching promotes self, if you like. Uh, but teaching that is true has the goal of love. It centres on others, not themselves. False teacher promotes their own reputation, if you like. All the genealogy stuff, the family trees, 
They're just trying to prove their self-worth. They're focused on themselves. The true teacher promotes Jesus. Ministry, the work of the whole church, flows from the health of our hearts and our consciences and our faith. Now, especially for leaders like Timothy, because true teachers disciple others in God's household towards Christian maturity with pure hearts, good consciences and a sincere faith in Jesus. Second qualification uh, for anyone involved in ministry with each other is knowing the true state of our heart. Because as we saw in verses 8 to 11, the law shows us that our hearts are not good. Now, Bible college, you can actually study the law in quite some detail. It's like looking into a mirror, in a way. You ever noticed? The closer you get to the mirror, the more imperfections you begin to see. You begin to see things right up close. You go, oh, that's a bit close. (laughs) When you study the law in detail like that, the closer you look, the more horrified that you can become about the state of your heart, the enormity of your sin. But the path of spiritual maturity, the path that followers of Jesus are on as disciples, calls for death to self, dying to self. That might sound, oh, wait on, what are you talking about? This is what Jesus says when he says, take up your cross and follow me. You're putting your old self-centred, sinful self up on the cross and taking up the new life that Jesus offers. A death to self-centredness, self-reliance, personal advancement of your own cause to instead follow Jesus and put him first. It's a movement from self-centeredness to Christ-centeredness, if you like. As we live life as new resurrected members, if you like, of God's household. Now, one of the things, you know, false teachers tend to judge others and not necessarily themselves. They hold up the law and they, you know put forward the law but they use it to judge other people. You can often tell them apart because they never reflect on their own sin. They never get up close in the mirror and look at their own hearts. They never advance in spiritual maturity themselves. You see, the more we understand how sinful we are, the more we will seek God's forgiveness the more we understand how undeserving we are, the more thankful we are for God's grace and mercy that he lavishes on us. The more we understand our own heart and our need for salvation, the more we are going to pray for others and love them just as Jesus loved us. To be qualified for ministry, you have to know the state of your own heart. But then in verses 12 to 17, Paul shows how to be qualified to minister to each other. You must be purified by Jesus. And that it's Christ's saving work at the cross that purifies our hearts. This is not a one-off thing. It starts and then it continues. So if you've put any honest effort into looking into the mirror, not too closely, but if you've put any honest effort into looking at your own heart, 
assessing it, you might be starting to feel pretty miserable at this point. <laughs> because purifying our own hearts is something that we can't do ourselves. We need help, but thankfully, God has sent help in his only son, Jesus. Paul never misses an opportunity to share his testimony about Jesus changing him, purifying his heart. If we turn to verse 12, uh, we can hear it straight from Paul's mouth. He says, I thank Christ Jesus. He's overflowing with thankfulness. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though he says, I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. He definitely was sinful. Even though he thought he was following the law to a T, he describes himself as a blasphemer, a persecutor and a violent man I was shown mercy, he says, because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. He's like these other false teachers, had no idea what he was doing. Verse 14, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul, one of the best trained teachers of the law. He describes himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees. He looked in the mirror and saw the true state of his heart. How is he purified? By Jesus. Abundantly pouring out grace and mercy and love into Paul's life. Verse 15, Paul gives us the first the very first of five trustworthy sayings that he gives to Timothy. He says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Timothy, you need to listen to this and take it on board. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. Paul doesn't say of whom I was the worst, you might notice. He says, I am the worst. He recognises that following Jesus starts with having our hearts purified. But there's also an ongoing nature to this purification. The more we accept the depth of our sin, the more passionately we follow Jesus. But the good news is that Jesus takes broken, sinful people like me, people deserving nothing but God's judgment. And he saves us. He takes the worst of examples, the ones who realise that they aren't worthy, and uses them to show the world how loving and gracious he is. What Paul says there, verse 16, he says, For that very reason... You know, the worst of sinners. I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. God's chosen Paul here. The worst case, a bully, a persecutor of Christians. And he was throwing Christians in jail. He was giving approval to their death like Stephen. Paul's 